Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Janice Mirkatani, activist and leader, poet, editor, and artist, and founding president of the Glide Foundation. The Glide Foundation has been built through the extraordinary partnership between Janice Mirkatani and her husband, the Reverend Cecil Williams, into an internationally renowned social justice and services organization located in the heart of San Francisco's Tenderloin District. Mirkatani has experienced and countered injustice throughout her life. Of Japanese descent and born in Stockton, California, she was interned with her family in a concentration camp during the Second World War. She suffered and rose above subsequent family dissolution, solitude, poverty, and sexual abuse to help so many others over the years to undertake their own journeys to dignity and self-reliance. An accomplished artist and author, Mirkatani has choreographed more than 35 productions as a producing director of the Glide Dance Ensemble and is San Francisco's second poet laureate. She has authored four books of poetry and is the editor of nine anthologies of literature by writers of color, women, youth, and children. Janice generously agreed to share some of that experience with us, and I'd like to thank you for, thank you. for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me. Your journey has been such an inspiration. Thank you. But you weren't always the Jan Mirkatani of today. No. You were a little Thank girl. Goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yes, really. You were, you were a little girl. You were ripped from your home and, and brought into an internment camp. Uh, you went through a, an amazing journey that might have beaten you down. Yet today you're here and you're, you yourself are uplifted and you lift others up. How did that happen? Oh, I think, um, you know, all of us make choices and we go through circumstances that are pretty unpredictable. And I guess I'm blessed to still be alive and have memory uh, and to have had help to make some choices that have made my life a little more productive than it could have been. Um, and I think community or someone who will love you in your family, someone who will believe in you is a real key to that. And I know that a lot of people feel that that is not existent in their lives. But um, sometimes we have to just, you know, sometimes we just have to be open to what messages come to us. And it took me a while, but I realized that my grandmother was very central to having saved my life um, as I was growing up and as I was being almost daily incested by a number of males in my family, uh, adult males in my family, that she was the one who said, you know, I believe in you. And even though, you know, silence surrounded us and silence surrounded that whole culture um, and our culture, and we didn't speak about the camps either. Uh, we had to bury our feelings about many things that still I knew that she believed me and she believed in me. And I think that that really did uh, encourage me in ways that I didn't realize until much later in life. So there was a reality, even the camps, the reality that existed but was silent. My mother did not speak of it for 42 years. 42 years. Yes. She, and I mean, every time I'd ask her about what happened, because I was just born and, and I don't have memory of the camps, when, and we were incarcerated for three years. So when we left the camps, I was about four years old. Mm -hmm. um, so I had very little memory, and when I would ask my mother in later years, how, what happened? Well, how did you feel? What was that like? You know, she would just change the subject. And I don't know if many people know this, but many, many, many people of her, of her generation, which is the second generation, called Niseis in America, would not speak of it. And it was really the Sansei, the third generation, my generation, that helped create the redress movement that got um, the commission hearings right. granted by the government so that people could begin to testify, those who had been incarcerated could begin to testify about those enormous losses that they had experienced during the war. Um, land, I mean, and these, I'm talking about American citizens who had their land stolen from them, who had their possessions taken away, who had three days to pack and take only what they could carry, who, had, who were put into detainment centers like, you know, horse stalls, like right. racing tracks. Uh, before they were shipped or bused or trained to different locations, 10 different camps throughout the country. With barbed wire and... And guard towers and, guard and towers and soldiers, and yes. And um, basically having to live in cramped one, one room, one space uh, barracks with entire families, like five or six people in a family. 
and again, with very, very little uh, of, of their possessions, very little to hang on to in terms of memory, and many of the families were separated. And I think that that was the, probably the cruelest thing that could have happened to our community, is that families were separated, they were sent to different camps, and of course, you know, just to have been ripped up, ripped up from your roots and from a home that you had built and from land that you had purchased as a citizen um, and to be taken away within a week's notice. You can imagine that that is, it was a surreal and um, humiliating and bewildering experience that probably cannot adequately be described. I wonder words. how many families ended up dissolving in the aftermath of that type of stress. We, we know families who, I mean, we don't hear about these, but we do know of families, you know, adults who committed suicide, men who became alcoholics, people who died just from giving up and, and, and broken hearts. Um, families, my family, my mother and father divorced. Uh, I'm not saying the camps are the cause of that, but I would say that the disillusion, the um, misery that people experienced, that it couldn't have helped. Uh, it could not have helped knit the family. We were relocated after we were released from Arkansas. We were moved from California, relocated to Arkansas camp in Roar. And then from there, my family moved to Chicago because we heard that there was less discrimination against Japanese Americans in, on the East Coast than in California. So we were in Chicago. My mother was a single parent. We, she had to work two and three jobs to pay the rent. Um, and I experienced her as a single mother being pretty alone and very, very um, unhappy. So, and I, I think the effects of that go so much deeper yes. than the time or the circumstances can describe, you know, whether it is in her own sense of vulnerability and um, her intense sense of loneliness and, uh, you know, always, I always got the feeling that she would pack everything. Uh, almost like she would have to be ready to move again uh, throughout her, the rest of her life. That kind of insecurity and the feeling of being expendable, the feeling of being not quite a first class citizen, of being someone who uh, could be taken away and without anyone there to speak for you. And with the blanket of silence and not being able to speak for yourself, yes. there's, th there's no way to redress it. That, that becomes the definition of self, that, well, that inability to speak, that inability to express. And I think that that's a universal uh, prison. I think silence is a universal prison for many of us who are marginalized. Silence is a universal prison? For many of us who have been marginalized. I mean, if you think about it, the whole, today, I mean, ghettos and barrios and poor neighborhoods and uh, different areas are of isolation are exactly that, where people don't communicate, where there is a barrier, an invisible barrier as it may be, but a barrier because of class or because of race. And you see it in the school systems, you see it in our different institutions, you see it in the quality of health care that's available in neighborhoods, you see it in the housing or the lack of housing. Um, and you know, again, it is this silence, it is the silent, marginalized people, the people who line up at, uh, at Glide even, I mean, they feel I mean, you feel this, this, this shroud that, of silence that covers the poor and the homeless because they feel like, you know, they are invisible. In fact, that is why I think Glide is, is so different and so unique is because we recognize the fact that people who are marginalized feel less than, feel unworthy, feel unheard, and feel that they would not be cared for. And I think that bottom line to Glide, when Cecil came 45 years ago and, um, opened up the church for all people, you know, those who were at the margins, those who were, who were spit on and who were thrown out of their houses because they were gay, lesbian, tran transgender, or bisexual, those who were, you know, third generation, second generation uh, welfare recipients, those who had been living in ghettos all their lives Drug or in addicts. projects. People Drug addicts, prostitutes, abused. absolutely. In fact, I think the first population of uh, people that I, w I started working with 43 years ago was a group of young hookers who were gay, who were running the streets, who were selling their bodies for drugs or money, and who indeed had been thrown out of their homes and who indeed were runaways because they had been abused. And, and uh, you know, I looked at them and 
you know, I was a naive co college graduate student, and I was, and I said to myself, I saw the mirror of who I was, you know, painted did you, faces. Did you actually see the mirror of, of who you were in, in people who were living such a different life? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we created a community. That is what is so important about Glide, is that wherever, wherever you are and whatever program you're looking at, community is being created. And church has never been a place of community for me. Church has always been a place of discrimination for me. You know, I've never, I've never done church. I've never done church well. And so when I first started working at Glide, Fortunately, I started working at the Urban Center because so if I... was church another box? It was like a box of silence? Is that, was that... Well, have you been to church and... Yes. And you had to sit still, right? I mean... Yes. I mean, my experience <laughs> with church is not exactly where you express yourself. I mean, you, you're, you have to be pretty quiet unless you're part of the choir. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I would say that church, church is a place where you... Um, are at your, in quote, best behavior, and where you go for uh, penitence, and where you go for absolution, and where you go for... Um, so somebody's going to absolve you, or you're going to go in as a penitent, or you're going to get dressed up and sit in your, in your straight jacket, or you're going to play your role very defined? Well, particularly as a woman of color. Yes. And growing up in a very, very white community, Yes, especially because, especially that, and especially in church. Um, and, you know, the, the sense was that of guilt all the time in, in church, that there was something that I needed to be forgiven or absolved for, <laughs> and I wasn't quite sure what it uh, was. And it was going to come from outside? It was going to come from God or Jesus Christ or whatever the situation was. But not from and inside. And even not from inside, never from inside. You were not validated from inside. And, I, and, and think about it, when you're a child, you're not really of the, your own validator. You are looking to your parents, you're looking to your community, you're right. looking to your teachers to validate you. And if you don't have a sense of that, if you don't have a sense of affirmation, then you don't have really truly a sense of you know, your own worthiness, I think. I, I think it's very, very difficult for people who are, are in, I mean, well, even people who are in a, in quote, normal, or in, in quote, a functional family situation, that that affirmation it comes in many, many ways. And I think we have to feel lovable in order to feel love, in order to, to give love. And that was what was missing in my life, I think. When, and when I came to Glide and I could see that these young folks were looking for love and looking for acceptance and looking for visibility, just like I was. I didn't know it as, as uh, graphically as they demonstrated it, I didn't know it as they did, as they embodied it, as they sold their bodies to get attention, to get the love that they needed. Um, but I, f I felt an affinity to them regardless. So in a sense, they were expressing their own need, but they were expressing it in a way that was very often damaging to, to, to themselves. themselves and their self-regard. But it was real. But it was still expression. And it was the truth. It was their they truth. They were the most honest young people I'd ever met. They would just tell you to your face, you know, who they saw. And they would tell you very honestly who they were. And they would tell you honestly, I'm running from myself. I can put on the lipstick. I can be in drag. I can be anybody I want to be. But inside, I know who I am and I know what's happened to my life. And they'll tell you in a minute. You know, I mean, it was, it was the most uh, open and real community I had ever met in my life. And <clears throat> I've been through, to, I've graduated a couple of colleges, and I've, you know, I was like looking for myself in what I would say in the ivory tower. And so you come to Glide, you, you have these encounters, and then it seems that, that you, you converted that experience into something that you helped to embed within the Glide culture of, well, I knew of very, that expression. I knew in bone what it meant to feel invisible. And I knew that poetry, which gave me life on the page, was a, a way in which other people, perhaps, could find their way to give their message. And, um, you know, and I want to make it, 
I want I really want to redefine art here right. for a moment right. because I think society, American society particularly, you know, I think it's different in other countries and I think it's different in countries that experience real revolution. Mm -hmm because I think art is part of revolution. I think art is very much a part of the life of revolution. It's where you, you know, it's where you express your voice. It's, what, it's, it's how you fight your battles. It's how you sing your survival song. Questioning it's, the conventional. It is absolutely something that emerges out of the needs of the people. And that's what I think art is at, in poor communities. It, was, it certainly was a place where I discovered art and poetry and expression and in a, in a different way, in a much more alive way. Because it, came, it rose out of the lives of the people. It arose out of the needs of the people. It rose out of the uh, immediate, basic, real struggles of the people. And that's what made it so, vi you know, so vital to me um, and so alive. Uh, so in my definition or redefinition of art, because America, again, tends to put everything into boxes. Church, you know, the religious, the economic, the social, right, right, right. the color, the culture, the race. And in this box here is art. And here is art, and it's really a luxury, isn't it, in America? Right. I mean, when you, when you say, and I, I also marginalize art, because, and I, I mean, I did my art at 12 o'clock midnight, you know, I spent my whole day trying to raise money for the, or working with Cecil to raise money or to working with, with the people to create these programs that were f fulfilling the basic needs of the people. Right. Feeding people, you have to, you know, you have to have real money to buy food. So of course, you know, like you're not thinking about poetry, you're not thinking about art, you're not thinking about theater, although theater is right there in front of you, um, when you're hungry. So were these women that you met when you first came to Glide, were they these are actually young guys? Young guys. Yes. Were they actually teenagers actually? Were, were they actually engaged in their expression of themselves in performance art? Well, they were themselves a performance. They were you, all, they were themselves a performance. Yeah. They were real theater. They drama. were real theater. <laughs> drama. They were real drama. Life. But not intentionally. It was truly life being lived on the edge, right. with in all of its full color, and all you know, bringing everything you have to the palette. You know, whether it is you're being a person of color and having come from an African American family that was you know run by a single mother, and your father abandoned you, or if your uncle raped you, or whatever, you brought that to the palette, and you made and you colored the canvas with that. And Glide was this amazing canvas of people, or tapestry of people, that had brought their own experiences to it. And it all was accepted. So you're throwing paint on the wall. You're well, throwing I mean, you're throwing art. art. You? <laughs> yeah, right, right. You're putting your life um, and in expression in its own unique form um, in whatever way you can with an audience that will listen and that will perceive you and will accept you. And you know, when I first, again, I don't do church, but when I first met Cecil and I saw what he was doing with the church, I said, as a poet, I saw this. I didn't see it for myself because I was like a little lost nobody and pretty self-destructive myself. I felt pretty invisible myself when I first came to Glide. But I saw this minister who was, you know, literally tearing down the cross and literally opening up the doors. And I got it that what this man, Cecil Williams, was doing was that he was opening the portal to God for every individual to be able to find their own God, their own spirit. So he was being very creative because he wasn't being, he wasn't being God. He wasn't saying, I'm the only one who is the microphone for God. I am here to have you experience life and to, experience, and to celebrate your life for who you are. And so you can choose whatever portal to spirituality. And it doesn't have to be God, it doesn't have to be Jesus. It doesn't have, I mean, it could be spirit, what, however you define spirit, goddess. So it's dissolving the minister into the congregation? No, it no. is not. Okay. No, it is the minister and you're a minister, I'm a minister, we're all messengers, okay? It is really us defining who we are and telling the truth about our lives. Ministering so people, to ourselves and each other? Well, you have to love yourself first. Yes. You have to define yourself first before you can 
help others discover who they are. And you're not telling them who they are. They have to do that. They have to do that work. It's like recovery. Recovery is a work of creativity. You know, I think spirituality is, is a work of creativity. And that's how I'm defining, redefining. I'm not redefining, but I'm, de I'm affirming art as the act of creativity. And I think God, if you really think about God, in its most, and I look at it as God is the metaphor, is one of the most creative forces that we have been taught about. So all that emerges <clears throat> is recreated through you, but it's uniquely you. God is the generative force within ourselves. Well, and I think that creativity within ourselves searches for community. Yes. And I think that that's where we discover God. I mean, I can only speak for myself. But that is when I understand that there's something greater and larger than myself.